Today, as I mentioned yesterday, we have a guest speaker. This is our first guest speaker. There's actually going to be, I think, two more, at least, guest lecturers. The first one is Garth Crow, an engineer off the uh, San Jacinto dis district of the illustrious San Bernardino National Forest and also a curriculum grad here, too. Yeah, so he's been through it. And uh, I asked him to teach this unit, like I said, mentioned yesterday before, so he has a strong background in this. And actually, I'm looking forward to this. I'm going to miss a chunk of it in the middle, but I'm going to go back and watch it on the video, too. So I'm really looking forward, to it, and I think you guys will enjoy today. So a um, couple admin things. The signing sheet's going around. I'm going to be gone for a big chunk of the middle. I have a chief officer's meeting at 10, and then I have a module leader's meeting at 11 until 1. So I'm basically going to be gone from probably 9.45 till 1. Um, you know, take lunch. I, I, you know, we leave at 11.30 to 12.15 for lunch. Okay. So you'll have your same lunch hour, and then um, there's no presentation, so you can pick up the lecture right after lunch. Okay. Um, let's see. And then, so it, sound, it doesn't sound good for tomorrow. I'm talking to Co. Or talking to Co. We said he talked to the guys up there, and it sounds like it's pretty much still under snow. So tentatively, we're going to be looking at canceling the lab two tomorrow, which is a bummer. Uh, we've never had to do this before, so. Likely, what I'll be looking at is I'll be looking at our next. I'll be looking at our next uh, training session, which I think is like February second or something like that. Does anybody have the schedule? Yeah. So, yeah. Second. Is that right? February second and third. What do we got? Second and third. Uh, planning and special support and chaperone in California. Okay. All right. I'll make a decision. Probably either swapping that lab or more likely maybe adding a day probably more like plan on adding a day to that um, to that week so that we can go down and do that assuming the weather is good <laughs> you know we'll see what El Nino allows us to do this year we just can't do it we just can't do it but uh, one way or the other so stay tuned for that and then there'll be some other schedule changes too like I said with uh, Dan I'm gonna try to get Dan probably to swap that even in so anyway it'll it'll be on the emails and so and these are the um, the lab sheets, so I'm not going to pass these out because apparently we don't need them. And I'll get you a confirmation on that, but tentatively, that's what we're looking at. So, anyway, uh, the rest of the day is yours. Do you need any? Did I miss anything? Any no. questions or concerns or anything for anybody? Comments on yesterday? Thank you much. There are donuts, which I'm going to go grab before I go back there. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, for bringing that in. All right, man. Thanks All right. for coming in. All right. So, uh, as a couple of you know me, I'm Gore Crow. I work on the San Bernardino National Forest, San Jacinto District. Um, got a background, I think I've been doing forest service, forestry type stuff since I got out of high school. That was a long time ago, before I had to start to get my gray hairs. And um, as far as the mechanized treatments and uh, fuels work, it, it, it wasn't like when I started this job that I had any aspirations to do fuels. Um, as most of us that are start out in the suppression side, you know, our careers change, you know, and our, our wants and desires change. At one point, you know, as you get to the point where all you want to do is run a chainsaw. Well, you know, after being a Sawyer and Hot Shots and stuff like that and going to engines, you just can't keep up with the young kids anymore. That's just the bottom line. 
And uh, as far as a fuels aspect is concerned, uh, I really didn't start getting involved in fuels other than the implementation side where you're going out to project work stuff until I went to Region 4, where I was in 18 and 8. During uh, those four months uh, when I would be laid off up in Region 4 uh, for the BLM and the Forest Service, I, I worked for both agencies up there at times. Um, well, what do you do with your time? Well, it was all about profit. There's a dollar out there, I could smell it. Um, so I started acquiring state contracts and also partnering up with uh, other contractors that I knew to get BLM contracts, mainly in uh, uh, mastication, uh, pre-commercial thinning, some handwork. So I have a very unique very unique experience when it comes to the private contracting and the equipment side. So um, currently, uh, right now, what I'm doing for the San Jacinto District is I'm uh, working on burn plans. I've done some uh, one veg report. I'm starting to work on another one. And uh, mainly working on trying to influence that landscape design and what we can do with the mechanized treatments. Um, so, some of this material um, may not be new to you. Um, I'm going to be very thorough and I'm going to be very, as a matter of fact, practical, even uh, when it comes to um, the mindset versus <coughs> agency versus the private sector. So, with that, um, I'm going to dive right in to Unit 7. Uh, part of this presentation, feel more creative because everything applies in the second, second portion goes a little bit more in depth on what to use with some of this equipment. So for Unit 6, we are going to identify the natural resource related issues resulting from mechanical fuels projects. Uh, we are going to discuss the issue of creating activity fuels and increased surface fuel loading through rearranged uh, rearrangement of fuels. Uh, we're going to identify types of mechanical fuels reduction equipment. And we're going to identify uses and limitations of mechanized equipment. So, there's mechanical and mechanized definitions. So, for our purposes, all non-fire treatments that utilize some sort of man-made tool to manipulate fuels mechanically whether it be machine or by hand. Mechanized is mechanical, but machine power. So I like to call that pure mechanized, where you really don't have any ground forces on the ground pulling and cutting and things of that nature. Um, from a private contracting standpoint, this is the best bang for your buck. Workman's comp and wages cost a lot of money. Uh, mechanical but not mechanized or people power. So you have what we do, our saw crews, um, stobbing, which is manual labor with blasties. You can't stob with equipment. Uh, clipping, manual pulling, and can anybody think of any others that we do, either as an agency or that you've seen as a private contractor as far as manual treatments? Excellent. That's what I like. A lot of you, if you if you have the need for clearance to do so, a lot of herbicide application is manual spot treatment, just for individual species, individual stumps, or something like that. Um. So, mechanical fuels treatments usually can't be called hazardous fuels reduction treatment, even though we all that's the end state or the end objective. Um. Usually, it temporarily increases a fire ignition severity and intensity potential of a potential project site because we are not just removing that fuel, we are just rearranging it. And what may have been a live fuel will be a dead fuel that's more receptive for the first couple of years, more receptive to, to spotting the fire. So, can anybody answer why WFHF pays for it?
well, why do we have WFHF dollars? Pardon? Fields project money? Yeah, fields project money, but there's also certain objectives behind the fields projects. We get direction from our land management plan, right? Mm -hmm. From the LMP. With that LMP, there's certain portions in there, and the really big one since 2000, since the Healthy Forest Initiative, um, was community protection. It's very political. It's extremely political, especially around these neighborhoods. I mean, most of these fuels projects that or you are working on in the Cleveland or the San Bernardino or in any southern forest is purely for urban interface protection. You know, you go to Region 3, Region 4, there's a lot of range up there. There is not, there's a lot of rural areas. So they could be for uh, grazing allotments, they could be for um, wildlife habitat improvement. There's very few wildlife habitat improvement projects in Southern California. So where does the dollar, where do the dollars come from? You know, it's WFHF, at least on forest lands. There are certain grants and agreements, for example, two chiefs agreements, where we're getting money from an agency called NRCS, and I'll get a little bit more into NRCS. It's kind of a really neat thing on, you know, as far as uh, community protection. And then some of the, some of the grants that the Forest Service gets made you from Fish and Wildlife Service. So one project I could think of on our district years ago was um, all the folks project out there. That was all Fish and Wildlife money, which is in Runner Valley by Lake Hammett. So that's one of the reasons why WFHF pays for it is because of the direction of our land management plan and what the dollars are allotted for. <coughs> So mechanical fuels treatments are almost exclusively preparatory in nature. You know, if you work on a hot start crew, you understand you have to prep a line before you burn it out. Or if you're going to do an understory burn, we have to prep possibly that forest canopy so that we do not have a high tree mortality rate. You've got to reduce those fuels to reduce your fire intensity. So it takes a natural fuel and creates activity fuel. Uh, it processes natural fuels that has been arranged by nature. So we're just taking taking it and putting it in a different configuration. Whether it be chips, whether it be shredded up by mastication or cut and piled. And it is often the first step of several towards a desired end state. It just basically starts a process. Um, I'm pretty sure that any of you I, one place I could really think of is like the Palomar District. I know you, you guys out there do a lot of fuels. And every, every project, there's different stages that we have to go through. It would be nice to be able to do certain projects in, in one treatment, and some you can, depending on what the desired end state is, but usually we have to do a process or years of treatment on the same acres. So, an activity fuel, the planning process must also include how to deal with activity fuels. So you do a lop and scatter, for example, what this is right here. And I see Mr. Fillmore's face in there. So, if you're on a wildland fire, and I know any of us at been suppression have gone into an area where there's dead down fuels on the ground. How hard is that if, you're, if your objective is full suppression? How hard is that to contain? You can't mobile attack that. In a lot of areas, you don't have enough water support hose lake for that fire intensity. So you have to get rid of that or mitigate that somehow. So obviously, this picture is illustrating the mitigation of the lock and scatter project. And there are lots of ways to dispose of the activity fuel. Get into that later. So we can pile and burn, which most of us in here have done a lot of. of broadcasts and jackpot burn, a chip and leave, which has its own benefits, a chip and transport, a grind and transport, bundle and transport, incinerate, or just leave it. 
And here's here's the uh, super lotto question. Uh, does anybody have any other ways or think of any other ways on how to dispose of that kind of tool? I got nothing. Actually, I, I do have some others, but they, they all are a version of what you see up there. So, there's always a question of when you utilize mechanical treatment. There are several concerns using or performing mechanical or truly mechanized uh, treatment. There's a lot that goes into the planning and preparation of that treatment. And that's basically our NEPA process. And of course, we'll get into a little bit of that later. But you know, in the environment that we are in, you know, with the, the NEPA requirements and also with our land management plan, we have to do a lot of work preliminary before we can actually get implementation equipment on the ground. So we have to learn how to mitigate that, you know, mitigate the things that come out of it. So areas with a fuel load too hot high to burn place, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, Stephen, have you taken them up to a Palomar where the state did that burn? Yeah, we looked at our uh, And the fire effects, or is anything improving up there yet? I, I don't know, maybe we asked the class, but I, I, I think it's still just kind of trying to figure it out. It's, it looked a little bit better, in my opinion, yeah. than when we looked at it. It's not in the black, but it's still really pretty open. So. Was there more mortality or as it, since the last time? It looked to me to be about the same, actually. Oh, okay. It didn't look terrible, it still works for you. But. Yeah. Understand. Or when the activity fuels can be dealt with appropriately. Uh, the wildland urban interface, uh, the public fuel saver, which it does, it's, it's a feel good thing. Uh, I've got a pro project going on with NRCS grant money in my community, and those people, most of the general public, doesn't they don't know anything about wildland fire, especially if they've never lived through it. And it's so daunting for them and that all of a sudden they get some help and they see that they have some clearance and oh, I feel really good now. Well, they become complacent. And they don't deal with the, all the reproduction. You know, that could happen very quickly. Um, it's easier to manage. And also smoke issues preclude the use of fire. And anybody off the top of their head think of any other reasons or when to utilize mechanical treatment? There's a time limit or you need to have it done within a certain time that you oh, yeah. can do it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What if you receive dollars that are going to expire and you need to get a project done before a restriction to a bird nesting season? Perfect example right there. So, with any mechanical treatment, there are resource concerns. You are putting, you are impacting that, that ground, that watershed, that soil, that ecosystem, one way or the other. A misconception, or not a misconception, but one thing that I have seen where people um, are alarmed by a mechanical or mechanized treatment is that they'll go out to a job site and see the condition it's in while the treatment is being performed before the true rehab has taken place. And it's like, oh my god, the soil's torn up. Oh my god, you have all of this, you know, all of these trees dead down everywhere and it, and it you know, looks terrible. It's like, well, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. You really do. But here are the concerns for, re, uh, for resources that falls into several categories depending on specialty. So this is, these 
um, topics right here are basically part of that NEPA process in the planning and the restrictions and guidelines set forth in a scope of work contract where the rubber meets the road. So you have your biology and botany. It's pretty self-explanatory. Air quality. We uh, what what's a air dis management district falls under down here? Uh, South Coast. Uh, Riverside County is South Coast. South, South Coast. Coast. So we have regulations that we have to follow in accordance with South Coast Air Quality Management District. Mm -hmm. Landscape architecture. That one's pretty important. The public likes to see visually pleasing landscapes, and so do I. And the wildlife likes likes it too. Um, invasive species. I, I think Southern California is a hotbed of invasive species. I mean, I don't think there's a forest in Southern California that has not been impacted by invasive species to the point where it seems like they're native. Um, watershed. It's a huge one, um, especially in the drought years. And that kind of goes hand in hand with our soils. Southern California is basically granted it's highly erosive soil, very highly erosive. Heritage resources, there's a lot of that because the people that lived here never had to migrate and the migration may have been just local, high country, low country, depending on where the food source was. And uh, of course fire, we're in one of the most fire prone regions in the nation, maybe in the world. So those are the concerns with that. So when we get to our biology, um, cutting nests or roofs of trees for birds or bats, we could possibly be doing that. And, and all of us, even on the suppression side, have witnesses, even if we're uh, cutting a direct fire line in the brush, the next thing you know, you, you're swamping a piece of brush and you notice a bird nest in it. You know, well, think of, think what happens when you're in a machine. Can you really see it when you're a big masticator? No, you can't see it. But crushing ground nesters. So, you know, like quail, they're a ground nester. Uh, that's why there are restrictions on doing work in certain months in some cases. Uh, noise to breeding pairs. Um, I think uh, certain owls, right? are very sensitive to noise, mm -hmm. and some are. Yeah. Uh, effects of the activity fuel on plants and animals. So I'm going to pick on you, since I know you. Um, <laughs> what do you think affects, of, or what might affect the activity, uh, or the activity fuel, what effects does that have on a plant or an animal? Say a plant. Cover? Oh yeah. Cover for an animal to escape a predator or just to like being in the habitat. How about on a, another plant? An activity fuel on another plant? Mm, growth. Could choke it out. Or we'll get into the activity fuel. <laughs> there, there's a lot more activities that that are produced by a treatment than just, say, from a fire perspective. Um, so, you're going to have to refresh my memory on this one. CWD, meaning CWD and snag retention. Coarse woody debris. Coarse woody debris. So, just thin data logs that are left out on the landscape for purposes of habitat. Okay. Super horrific. I understand. Thank you. Uh, pea sizes and the interaction with the habitat. I'll give you a good example. Um, you do a mastication project and the scope of work states that you cannot have a, your biomass or your residual left over of more, no longer than four feet in, in diameter or four feet in length. There's a reason for that. You know, mainly the breakdown, also how about the ease of treatment of, of a follow-up treatment, you know, down the road in the next year or so. Can you think of any other film work? Hmm. 
So, <coughs> air quality and landscape architecture. How many here have worked on a smoke management plan? Kind of? What do you know about a smoke management plan? Hmm. When I got involved with helping out on one, it was uh, mainly where the smoke's got a lot into, like in the valleys where people were living. Um, that was mainly when I got into it. Yeah. I understand. Well, our air quality reports it help take into account dust and exhaust and pollution. And, and really what that pollution they're really concerned about is the what's called PM 2.5 or less, 2.5 microns, I want to say. That's stuff that gets into people's lungs and they can't get rid of it. And uh, PM 10 is a big one. That's kind of the stuff that you could actually see in a dust storm or the smoke that you could see. And your body can actually filter a lot of that out. But uh, our fuels treatments, not only if we burn, do they produce air pollutants, but even if we masticate certain times a year, there's also dust pollutant that could impact a local community or local wildlife. Um, it helps reinforce the NEPA analysis. Uh, landscape ar architecture, NEPA design criteria when developing treatments. So this is a really important one when we design and develop a treatment. It would be really nice in some areas where, say for example, you have a chemise field and it's pretty much a monoculture or contiguous type field. It's like, great, it's on flat ground, there's really no rocks, the, the habitat there, it needs to be opened up, the wildlife's going to like it, let's take it all out. Okay, great. Well, wouldn't it be nice to leave some islands in there? Not only for as a visual, but also to help maintain that habitat for cover and things for you know, your birds and your animals to actually get into where they need cover. Um, that's just a, an example. <coughs> the requirements in the NEPA land management plan for things like stump heights and slope directions. We all understand we've been on projects where we're cutting and you have a criteria there say stumps no greater than four inches in height. How many people have seen any verbiage like that or heard anything like that? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a reason for that. On the fire line, for us as a practical matter, you could trip and fall or you could fall on it and get punctured. Um, fading cut treatments. Those are really nice because I like to try to incorporate those into a far zone of an urban interface type in an urban interface situation where you have a treatment. You face, for example, you have um, very heavy fuels with virtually no fire history, and now you have your fuels treatment. Well, we've all seen treatments that just have one line, either a straight line or even a, a line that follows a train, but it's like everything's clear and all of a sudden you have your natural fuels. It is kind of nice to be able to do like a selective thinning or do a mosaic pattern and within the first couple hundred yards, even up to half a mile, just blend that clearing into um, your natural existing. Am I explaining that correctly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from a fire standpoint, it's actually great because if you do that in a, in a wildland fire setting, what's that do to a fire when your objective is to, for example, protect structures? It reduces that fire behavior from you have X amount of BTUs in the naturally existing fuels, all of a sudden it hits your broken fuels, it breaks up and dis starts disrupting you know, that fire behavior to the point where it hopefully gets your flame links in your main treatment or your target area down to something four feet or less that's manageable in suppression. Or even manageable from a um, fire ecology standpoint where you're not cooking all your trees, hopefully, even in one on fire. 
Um, levels of, of intensity depending on uh, visual appeal, so we kind of got on that. It's something that looks more natural is definitely more appealing. It is to me. You know, it is to especially the general public, the people that really you know, have the ability to scrutinize the agency, especially those special interest groups. And I'll kind of get into that too when it comes to mechanized treatment. You know, uh, I'll give you an example like uh, uh, this year a club, uh, the Chaparral Institute, things of that nature. So their philosophies may be different than others, but you can still get under agreement with them as well. Does anybody have any questions to this point? Is the, is the pace okay for you? Perfect. Okay. With any treatment, it doesn't matter if it's a prescribed fire, it doesn't matter if it's a natural fire, mechanized treatment, mechanical treatment, you're going to open up those areas to be susceptible to invasive species. Um, there's a a whole laundry list of invasive species that already exist close to these areas. And now you're opening up, a, I'll give you an example, Russian thistle or tumbleweed. You have a brush field, do tumble, tumbleweeds really don't like to roll through a chemise field, right? They just stop, and now you open that up. And now they have a clear path to tumble and uh, you know, spread their seed bank. So that's just kind of an example. Uh, so treatment should be designed to minimize the potential for fire or potential for spreading invasive species. So either directly or indirectly, a direct method is that a piece of equipment brings whatever seed bank on the equipment itself because it hasn't been washed or inspected. Or indirectly. Indirectly is those things blowing in from somewhere else after the treatment or you open it up to where people and animals can walk through it a lot more easily. Now they're bringing it in on their shoes. That's indirect effect. Are there any others anybody can think of? Now, there's, yeah, there's several other, there's several ways it could happen, but those are kind of some of the main highlights. <clears throat> So we can use MX or RX where RX may aid the spread. Anybody know what the difference between, you know what a RX is? Prescribed fire, right? What's MX? So what about, so some of these, some of these invasive species actually like fire. You know, their seed bank is brought up to a certain temperature in order to germinate. The seed bank already may be there prior to the entry, but they need that heat in order to germinate the seed. I think that's that's how I interpret it. it, it is that uh, correct? Yeah. Or it could be the other way around. Some species like more sunlight. So that is the main impetus or the main, um, main thing that might trigger that invasive species takeover. So it, the equipment really does need to come in clean to the site. And we, we see it on the fire line when we go to any place, other forest, other region, where we go through the weed wash. i got to be honest with you, that weed wash, it's all fine and dandy, but it feels good. But it, it, it really doesn't do a thorough cleaning. I go through the weed wash most of the time to knock the dust off before I go home or when I get to the when I get to the fire, but it really doesn't get in there thoroughly to get any invasive species off. It just kind of, okay, kind of a wash down, all right, drive through, but is there any inspection afterwards? Well, and actually, field. physically, it's physically inspecting to see if there's any residual left over. If there isn't. So that's one thing when contracted equipment comes to no job, if you're really trying to prevent invasive species, it really needs to be scrutinized pretty good. Um, equipment often needs to stay on site for the duration. If it's clean coming in once, 
there's no guarantee that it's going to be clean coming in the next time. Say, for example, you have a contract that has a 365-day limitation or a deadline. Well, this contractor now has a job in Riverside County, and it's only going to last a month. So they take that equipment somewhere else, do another job, and then bring it back. It, so it needs another inspection. So really, it often needs to stay on site for the duration. And if it is does go off site, even for repairs, it needs to be inspected again. Um, watersheds and soils. This one is huge when it comes to a contract inspection. Because what do you notice when you go into a project area, and especially under wet conditions? You see impressions into the ground. You see areas where water can flow and start running and start eroding. So the tracking equipment can lead to the erosion and downstream sediment. We really are in a high, highly erosive soil area, Southern California is. And that's the main reason why we have our valleys like this in between these hills get so large because of natural erosion. Well, since European settlement, maybe even before, I, that rate has actually increased because of the highly erosive soil and the, you know, the manipulation of human beings. Um, it can disrupt the upper soil horizons by tracking and turning. So when you have a track, say a dozer or an excavator, and you turn, it's not like a wheel that will actually just roll a bit more passively over the soil. It has to, something has to give, and it's used the soil underneath the tracks. And I'll get into ground pressures. Um, so wet versus dry soils and are frozen. It's kind of self-explanatory. You know, this wet soil, you can get stuck, you can create deep ruts. Dry soil is really dusty, and if it's frozen, in my experience with mechanized treatment, especially up in Utah, frozen soil was good soil because it was all clay. And you didn't want to work it when it was wet because you weren't getting out. Um, the slope, huge effect on if you could do a mechanized treatment or mechanical treatment. You know, nobody wants to roll a piece of equipment down a hill. So 35% slope or less. Effects of machine pass rates. Is that the uh, ground pressures? Just uh, going back and forth. Oh, back and forth. Yeah. Okay. So a good somebody that understands fuels treatments or mechanized treatments will plan to where they only have to enter an area once to get that treatment done, or as minimal as possible, and try not to go on, you know, drive the same route in and out. But sometimes, driving the same route in and out may be a best option, because now all you're doing is localizing that resource damage, and that's where most of your rehab is, instead of having to rehab the whole project. You know, it, it just depends on what the soil is doing. You have to be able to look at it and say, oh, okay, this is what I'm doing, so this is how I'm going to mitigate it. Um, soil type. Soil type is different here than, say, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Idaho. Highly erosive soil, and it's a granite based soil. So it's really nice to be able to knock, you know, you could use a hose and spray it off your shoes. But you go to these areas where there's a clay component and it sticks to everything. It just, it's nasty. But that also means it tears up really easily with equipment and the effects seem to last a lot longer in the clay type soils because they harden up. And the scar visually stays for a long time, a lot longer than in uh, granite. Uh, compaction and soil function. Uh, different machines compact soils at different rates. For example, if you had a wheeled machine, the ground pressures may be higher than a track machine if driving in a straight line. 
Oh, you might have a track machine that weighs, you know, 45, 50,000 pounds, but your PSI might only be 5 PSI on the tracks on the soil. So it's like, okay, what do I want? Do I want a wheeled machine in here that's going to put more PSI, even though the machine's lighter? Or do I want a machine that, you know, that's going to be less? Um, and the soil function. You're going to have to jump in here on soil function. Uh, it just means like uh, water filtration through the soil. We have like a, a normal soil. It hasn't been compacted. Just function well. The plants can grow on it. You can have the deleterious effects to the soil. That's okay. all that meant. You know, worms moving through it. I'm sure other people can grow on this too. But that's what that means. That's the negative effect. It have an overly compacted soil, which can result in machine growth. I understand. Thank you. Yeah, that's what that looks like. You bailed me out there, man. Well, you're on your own, man. There you go. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I'll see you guys in a little bit. Be well. Yeah. All right. This is cool. There's actually some All right, I'll see you guys in a little bit. Jose, I'll see you in a little bit. Sal, I'm going to ask a favor of you. Oh. If there's something in here, some verbiage that you put into this slide presentation that I can understand. Mm -hmm. Explain this. Yeah, you just make a note so I can get back later. Well, do you want better? Oh, all right. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you must. Do you work for? The, you must work for the Forest Service. I work for dispatch. Oh. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> all right. Hey, Fillmore's gone. Party started. <laughs> so let's get into heritage resources now. One thing I've noticed in this in this job, and it doesn't really matter if it's a Forest Service, it doesn't matter if it's another agency or the general public. A lot of us don't recognize an area that contains cultural or heritage resources when we're standing on top of it. You know, a person, you know, for example, I've had an interest in it since I was a kid, so I can just look in there and say, you know what, this is probably here. And just walk it, and then walk in there and say, oh yeah, I identify it here, here, and here. But I've actually been on jobs, not only as an agency employee, but also in the private sector, where I enter an area that contains cultural resources, back off, call a resource officer in, an archaeologist, and they don't know what they're looking at when they look at it. Oh, no, you're clear to go through it. Hey, excuse me, uh-uh. Right here, look. Oh, how'd you know it was there? Well, just look. So... And how many people on the fire line have seen absolute ancient villages destroyed by a dozer? I have, even on the Cleveland. But there's so much brush you don't really know it's there, right? When, but if you have some experience or know what you're looking for, you can actually look at an area and say, well, Maybe we should inspect that area before we enter with equipment. Now, during suppression, everybody's in suppression mode, everybody's in emergency mode, so it doesn't happen. It's an unfortunate thing, but it's understandable. So, it's center, centered primarily on physical disturbance to artifacts, and there's a lot of artifacts on the San Bernardino and Cleveland. So these people never had to move. It was the perfect environment for them. They had the beach. They had the ocean, they had the desert, they had this wonderful climate that uh, they didn't have to leave. Uh, mechanical can often be much more damaging, it, which it really is, man. You, you put a heavy piece of machinery through some someplace, and now you're, a track is turning or a drum on the masticators is turning, and next thing you know you're breaking up matatis or pieces or, or shards of pottery or lithic scatter that you're just destroying it. Um, subsoil disturbances by mechanized equipment. A lot of our cultural resources in your lower valleys are generally covered up by erosion. The things that we do normally see are the stuff mid to upper slope where the soil is actually eroded away from it. So you are in an area that's relatively flat and rolling, and now your track <coughs> is going this, this deep, and now you're 
destroying or exposing something. And the thing is, the destroy and the disruption and the destroying may not only be limited to that equipment, but you're opening up an area now that the general public can walk into. Now they see this stuff, and now they're pilfering it. Uh, and a lot of cases, we don't even know what's there. I think, oh, yeah, go ahead, Matt. I, I, I just think that that's a double-edged sword there, though. It um, is. You know, is. having contributed to some major damage to an arc site on um, Palmar Mountain, uh, you know, the firm boss at the time, or the division here at the time, he didn't even know that the arc site was there. And the archaeologists knew it was there because they went to go look at it after we had been in there. And we had done a lot of damage to, I mean, so, I don't so know how, many, how long it took to re restore it. But if they knew it was there, they should have said, hey, th this is what you guys are supposed and, to look for. And that Don't was, hurt this path. Uh, uh, like I just six, think it could have been. Is uh, that the six mile marker? Yeah. And, and, and cut line right through those and, and, yeah, here, and, and here's the thing. Only about 10% of the cultural resources on any given national forest or public land has been identified. Like when I worked on the Arizona Strip, for the Arizona Strip BLM, every place that you walked literally had some evidence of prehistoric activity, even if it was uh, lithic scatter from arrowhead chippings, from, you know, from migrations year to year, you know, hunting and gathering or if it was actual sites where you know people went to seasonally. It's the same thing here. There's so much brush and so much trees covering this stuff that you can't possibly walk every square inch to know what's there. And if, even if it was, it might be covered up. But to get back to what you said, when and that's I'm gonna kinda get into this when I get into the second section, the section I created mechanized treatment it's less scientific and it's more common sense so you're gonna you're gonna kind of hear some gripes too um just along that line and then another example was on the rough fire we were cutting indirect line on some ridges and uh, the art the uh, heritage people came out and they were flagging what they thought were art sites but they weren't telling anybody what it was yeah so next thing you know we're playing ball with round rocks just because they're laying all over the place. I mean, we shouldn't, you know, they're just rocks. And then it come, turns out that they're not supposed to be there and they're special rocks or whatever. Yeah. I yeah. think that there needs to be better communication from and, them to us. And, and that's, we know that they're special, we're not gonna be touching yeah. them. Yeah, and that's what I'm really gonna press upon when I, I have a message in here to the, 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 uh, the COR and the job inspectors, you know, um, that's, one of them that I'm going to get into. Trust me, you just you just hit something right there that I'm really going to be covering. Hand thinning is often much less disturbing than pile burning, and it's the best, which is true. Which is true. We don't do much damage when when we walk somewhere. You know, it's it depends on how much you weigh, how much psi is your footprint creating. You know, so a pile and burn or a pile and uh, and uh, winching those piles out to chip might, might be your best option. Or your best option is just leave that as an island, which will give away, which will sometimes, especially in Region 3 and Region 4, give away to people that actually go in and pilfer the artifacts, know where they are, because now all of a sudden you're leaving this island. It's like, oh, there has to be artifacts in there. I'm just going to go check it out. We're going to be taking a break here in about five minutes. So what do you, so what do we do with machines? You know, I, I love machines, man. They just, everything about mechanized treatment, to me, it's like, this is the best bang for the buck. We're not breaking the workforce's backs with all of this, dragging these, dragging this brush 200 yards up a hill to chip on a road. How many people have done that on fire? That's just stupid, man. Why are we doing that? We have a winch on the chipper, man. Use it. Cultural. Yeah. Yeah. So 
it almost all simply rearranges the fuel. And so there's a, a rearrangers versus eliminators. So rearrangers would be like pure mastication. What's a fuel eliminator if it's mechanized? What do you think process has to happen? What process do you think has to happen to actually eliminate that fuel? Without burning it. Okay, that's the long way around. You know, the scenic route. Are you talking about the... Um we have one, you just got one that's canceled. That's burning, right? Oh, right. Can we <laughs> Bingo. Chip and haul. Logging contracts. But still with logging, you have a residual fuel left over that you don't deal with, right? But the main bowl, but the trees are gone. The heavy fuel is gone. So there's, uh, there's also other methods. Um, some areas have a cogen. Is there still a cogen down in the Centro? Or down in the desert? Do you know what a cogen is? Mm -hmm. It burns biomass to create electricity. So that's a niche market there, but you have to have a lot of biomass going down there to constantly feed it. It's kind of a pain. Um, how about this? Does this machine meet the, a fuel reduction objective? It could or it couldn't. It depends on what your objectives are in accordance to the NEPA and the overall what you're trying to do. Are you doing a wildlife habitat improvement? Are you doing a watershed? Or are you doing community protection? Or a few other things I didn't mention. So it depends on the natural uh, fuel state, um, what your objective is, and your desired end state. And with that, let's take, uh, how much time do you guys think you need? Ten minutes? Yeah. Ten minutes, okay? Ten. All right. Hey, look lively over there, so. <laughs> So, fuel modification, modification patterns. So, what do we do with this fuel? Of course, stuff that we do all kinds of stuff with it. See all your own options. So, we cut it up, we shred it apart, chop it to bits, crush it flat, uh, pull it out, push it over, chip it smaller, grind it together, or incinerate it. And it's gone. Notice that incinerate is at the bottom because a lot of this, all the things we do with it, really the most effective way or the only way we're going to get rid of a fuel on a site is to burn it, right? So most of this, the things that you see before incinerating is just part of the process. So for contracting equipment, sometimes there is a specific need for the equipment. One of the jobs that I really like what's happening right now up on Mount Laguna is the whole tree chipping up there. Have any of you guys seen the whole tree chipping project up there yet? It's awesome. Those machines are amazing. So logging down the question, who wants to try to find a market? for sticks and when your nearest mill is 12 hours north. Can't do it. Who wants? Who also wants to create lumber out of ponderosa pine or yellow pine or jeffrey pine? There's too many, you know, too many big knots in it, right? It's not structural by any means. So most of the time the contractor chooses the actual piece of equipment. Okay. Um, that, okay, that, that's all fine and dandy, but I'm going to get into it. Beware of that. We provide the specs in the desired end state, which is true. That means, in accordance to the land management plan, in accordance to the NEPA requirements and, and job restrictions, 
they really need to be written into the specs of that scope of work and the contractor understand that scope of work. And let me tell you, I see scope of, scopes of work that are so loose, it's like, oh man, this is great. So if you have a contractor that doesn't understand forest ecology, you're going to get something that looks really torn up. So, the specs will be based upon the design criteria. Let the open market work naturally. And I'll get into that a little bit. Let the contractors get creative. What does that even mean? Get creative. Like, put it on them. Like, you set the boundaries, but let them figure out how to solve the problem. To, to that degree. So, give them a leeway to... Understandable. Understandable. And I'm, I'm glad you said that because I have a section here, good truck contractors versus bad contractors. You remember, I'm, I'm the guy that smelled a dollar out there <laughs> and I'm going to go chase after it. Of course, I can't do it anymore because I'm working full time with the Forest Service. But um, the contractors do get creative and it's all profit driven. Some, some jobs are even worth looking at for a contractor. A contractor that doesn't know what they're doing is going to bid on that job. The contractor knows what they're doing. They're just going to walk away from it or their bid's going to be really high. What job are you kind of talking about? How about the, oh, just a right? guaranteed profit losing job for a contractor is hand work. You got wages, you got workman's comp, you get sick. Um, the whole nine yards. If you're going to run legitimate business as required by the state of California, you're going to have a workman's comp rate of 80%. So every $100 you pay an employee, you're paying $80 in a workman's comp. It's very expensive. So the mechanized is more. Oh, yeah. Longer. That's the best thing for your buck if you're trying to make a profit. How about the equipment? Isn't a part. It's just some construction company that is, is out of work and they're looking to make a dollar out there. Now they don't have the right equipment for the job and they don't know what they're doing. Um, do not try to design, design projects that only one business can do. For example, give an example Halbert. Yeah, true. Because what you're doing is you're knocking out the competition where one contractor can do it. But there are some jobs where you need a specific task done and you may not have an option but to you utilize that one contractor. For example, the whole tree chipping that's going on right now. There's only a couple contractors I know that even own that piece of equipment because it costs so much. So here's a word about contracted hand crews. Okay, so this is the slide Fillmore put together from his viewpoint. So competition with force. Um, is there competition when it comes to that? Hey, so, some, of your, some of your landscape design and your project specs are perfect for private contractors. I'll give you an example. It's absolutely brilliant. The lop and scatter in your chemise, in your ribbon wood or red shank on Palomar Mountain. Then you come back through and burn that log and scatter rather than wasting your time piling it. So why would we pile? It's a waste of time. Have a bunch of people go in there with chainsaws, cut it down, lay it down, let it dry out, broadcast burn. That's a perfect example uh, with for a contracted hand crew. So they can be useful for quick work. They don't have restricted from 9:30 to 6 or 6:30 to 5. They're on the job site and you usually get more hours of work out of them because they don't go to the station, they don't have the coffee like we do. I hate to say it, we are very inefficient when it comes to fuels work in hand treatments. Oh, I got I got a something score for you, you're gonna learn. <laughs> I have a cool question. Yeah. Um, so so why do we usually do a lot of I know we probably do problems because of Fireplace, right? Keep it testing down. Uh, Piles are effective if you're doing a timber understory where you have to thin out. Right, because I know we do a lot of piling, but in a brush, and I always thought it was always more effective, faster when you do it. It's easier to burn. Well, hey, what's going on, man? Um, 
We pile in certain areas if the. Because it seems like you're wasting time this? when you're piling and you have to pay for the paper. How many of us think outside, outside the box? That's why you're here, right? Most of you individuals in here are people that actually implement work on the ground. If it makes sense, design it, take it up the chain. You're exactly right. Why are, why are we doing this? Anybody that's going to make reductions, right? Exactly. The reason we pile and burn, the reason we pile though, smoke management, is because no, it has to do with the number of RXP3s and the number yeah. of RXP2s. Okay. Yeah. So on any given day, you could send out an engine with an RXP3 and we'll burn 10 piles. Where if it's locked and scattered, it's automatically not RXP2. And yeah. now it becomes a big thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's a very valid point. But there's also the other thing. Anybody that spent any time more than two years on, like, say, a hotshot crew, I don't know if I've ever heard a hotshot crew member when we're doing something not say, what are we doing? This is stupid. Yeah. Oh, my God. Seriously. So it's that ground experience that hopefully will mitigate what you just asked me in some cases. Um, Dolo routine projects. How many, we all have gone out to projects where it's just like day in, day out, day in, day out, and it's like every day you're like, oh my God, I don't want to go back out to this piece of you know, real estate in, you know, anymore. Uh, large homogeneous project areas, just huge brush fields where all you're doing is cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. Maybe stacking, maybe not, and it's just your engine module that has to do 60 acres by the end of summer. I had to do that in Utah. 60 acres of production, cut and pile, one engine module. It was rough. Uh, areas with simple prescriptions, pretty self-explanatory. Hey, this is the objective, do this. Stay out of this area, stay out of this area, leave this species alone. Don't pile next to this, that, or the other. Cost per acre. This is a good one. So estimating the cost per acre is a common duty. And there is no magic formula. So it's based entirely on past contractors, info you can glean from contractors, current economic conditions, seasonality of the work, and how difficult the work is. Okay, that's all fine for the book answer. But really, these acres do cost money to treat. If you, and it really would help if you had a full understanding, if you are going to contract that out, how much a workman's comp rate is. How many days will it take, or how many months will it take for this contractor or this workforce to complete this project? I've seen dollar amounts come in um, per acre bid from contractors, maybe a guy that has a chainsaw or two and a pickup on a lock and scatter and pinion juniper at $30 an acre. It's like you can't even, it's going to cost you $30 in fuel just to get to the job site in one way. You know, one way for a day. So that's a loser to have. If you have an understanding of what labor costs, then you have an understanding of what a cost per acre should be where you're going to get a quality contractor to actually see the job through that understands the scope of work. Even something as simple as the price of fuel for that month can make the difference between whether there's a profit margin or not. And now I'm sounding like I'm advocating private contracting. Maybe I am, in a sense. But it's reality of you know the, the business, you know, the business of forestry and power contracting. You know, there's a lot of factors in there that will affect your costs. What if somebody gets sick? Two people get sick, or your whole crew gets sick with the flu. Now you're a week or two behind and you have a deadline to meet. What are you gonna do? Any default in the contract. So there's there's a lot of things in there that can happen. Uh, current economic conditions. It seems like more contractors come out of the woodwork when the economic conditions are poor. 
and mainly those, a lot of those contractors that come out of the woodwork do not have forestry experience or understand forest ecology. A seasonality of the work, you actually have a better workforce if you to get a crew that understands forestry in the wintertime than you do the summer. Why do you think that is? Seasonal as well. Bingo. Yeah. How many of you in here, I have, have looked for work outside when you're laid off? What do you know? You know how to pull a pull cord, right? Run a chainsaw. Seems pretty logical. Um, how difficult is the work is? When you're doing handwork, usually you're in a pretty nasty country because you can't get a machine in there, man. So, there it is. So, you do have operational considerations. Uh, pass rates required to meet the prescriptions or your footprint. So, one of the things that might be written into a scope of work is a restriction on how many PSI a piece of equipment can displace on the soil. So that's, those are all calculations that are brought up by hydrologists. But a good track contractor will understand how many PSI will be displaced on that soil. Uh, follow NEPA design criteria in FA and contract work. The contractor must understand how to read the contract designer of that, or that scope of work. And that is all dictated by the NEPA requirements. Um, slope will affect what machines can be used, and your slope will affect activity fuel processing me methodology, if that makes any sense to you. Does that make any sense to anybody? The slope will affect activity fuel processing methodology. <coughs> you tear up soil, you basically give some place for that invasive species seed bank to lodge itself in place. You're opening up that soil. <clears throat> you know, it's, anybody that off-roads in here knows that if they're driving on flat ground, they're tearing up the soil less than when they're trying to go climb a rock climb. Um, what's the access, uh, what's the access for follow-up treatments? So when you're doing a fuels treatment, usually it's multiple step, right? So if we do, one treatment, are we going to be able to access for the next treatment coming in? So you're looking six months, a year, two, three years down the road. And so here's some common machines. So you have machines that are actually specifically designed to do a treatment. For example, a dedicated masticator, a dedicated um, feller butcher, dedicated skitter. And some of them are machines that are, have attachments. Probably one of your best, most versatile machines are excavators, because you can put all sorts of attachments on an excavator. So you have mulchers or masticators, uh, flail drums, uh, rotary mowers, Dixie harrows, rakes, uh, dozer rakes, chains. And then you have integral machines, uh, chippers, tub grinders, dedicated masticators, incinerators, dozers, and harvesters. Do you think we're going to see many harvesters here? Down here is this, this far south. How about tub grinders? Huh? A tub grinder. You'll see a picture of it. When the money's good, when you have emergency money like we did after the huge bug kill about, what, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, there was a dedicated tub grinder there. Um, incinerators, obviously you guys have them, right? Burn curtain. And you're not going to see many. You're not going to see any Dixie Harrows. You're really not going to see many rotary mowers, except if it's Caltrans or County Roads mowing along the side of the highway. You're not going to see many chains here. Chaining at least in Southern California, has gone bye-bye. It still happens in Region 3 and 4. And that's maybe like juniper treatments. Yeah, put a big ship anchor chain between two dozers. And they basically destroy everything in the path. Wow. 
try writing the meatball on that one. No. That was a U.S. Army, Army um, brainchild back in the 1950s. The cost per acre, I've actually done it one time, and the cost per acre to get it done was $52 an acre. It's very effective, but it requires follow-up treatment. Um, your most expensive bang for your buck in here is probably the tub grinder. That's yeah, probably the most, because that it just costs a lot of money. I mean, that thing, the machine alone probably cost up to a million dollars. Which contractors, like, they own the equipment or it's just rented? Oh, uh, they own the equipment. They Very rarely do you see forestry equipment rented out because there's so many moving parts on it and it's so expensive that if it's a piece of rented equipment, what's the mentality? How many of you rented equipment, even a backhoe from a rail yard? Do you take care of it or do you pound it? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you're not gonna see yeah. And you're not gonna see many dozer rakes on federal lands. I see them on private lands under NRCS contract. But in a lot of cases that might be perfect to get to stop some of our shrub oaks where they keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. Get rid of the brain, get rid of the part of that thing to get rid of it for good. That's the objective. I think she might have said I didn't find this on the flail drum. The what? Flail drum. Flail drum? That is a brainchild of World War II. Hobart's funnies. It was actually the original concept was um, it was in front of a, a tank to oh, get rid of landmines on the chain. But that design actually worked really well to get rid of fuels, to just pulverize it and shred it up for future treatment. So you have your attachment types. You have your non-motorized attachments, which are passive. So your blades, your rakes, your drag chains, your crushers and choppers, and shears. There's a question mark there. I'm wondering if shears are passive since there are actual moving parts, or is it an attachment to another machine? I haven't seen any shears here, but I think shears would probably work really good in, say, a say a fir tree reproduction area, where there might be a stewardship contract for small diameter logs, or say the lodge pole, or back east in some of your um, softwoods. Um, so you have your horizontal flat attachments, your flails, chipper drums, uh, knives, mastication heads, hammers, etc. And then vertical shaft attachments, or attachments where you have your mower decks and your harvesters. And we're not going to see any harvesters here. And not many times are you going to see shears or flails and crushers and choppers. It has been tried on the Angeles. Crushers. Have, you seen, have you seen them on the Cleveland? No, when I was on the Angeles, they were doing it. The county, LA County was doing it, and they have, it looks like a big sheet foot. Yeah. And they just hit the dozer and let it fall down, whatever, like 300 yeah. feet off the ridge. And but, they back up. but the Angeles doesn't have the granite boulders like we do down here, do they? No, and they were doing it. It actually was pretty impressive because when you got done, you can, there was a lot of dirt exposed. Yeah. It pushes the, the material into the soil, so they wanted to burn it afterwards, and there was no way to do it. We had no like bush to put up, like little little pieces of what was sticking up. Yeah. And we can yeah. it's done for three or four years. Finally, start coming back. Yeah. So, they did that here too on the Walmart. Did they? On the uh, some fuel cool. breaks, the trails. Yeah. yeah. Well, this this one's and uh, they make pretty burn it. It's nice. Um, is, uh, is that old chain still sitting behind? Uh, Actually, the ball's gone, but the chain's still Yeah, well, that's actually kind of a brilliant idea, as long as it doesn't pull the piece of equipment off the bridge down with it. So, here's your tool types. Uh, let's just start on the top left. Uh, you have your flail <coughs> chain. Obviously, that uh, rotates at a high speed. You have your hammer teeth which actually are mostly attached to a masticator head. Your flail knives, um, that's just another design, but they pretty much all do the same thing. Uh, you have cutter teeth, those are actually uh, carbide tooth. 
um, you know, hammer flail. Uh, compression shears. Can everybody see that compression shear? Right here. So the concept is, and it actually works, you could put that, that looks like one that attaches to a bobcat um, type machine, and you hook the hydro off on it, you drive up to whatever you're trying to shear off, hit, hit your hydraulics, and it just cuts it off. And, but the thing is, it doesn't look like there's any, any guide there to where that thing falls, right? Mm -hmm. So it may fall right on the machine. So that's obviously for small diameter stuff. And then you have your uh, chipper drum blade. And you could actually attach these to mastication heads. Uh, good example. How many of you seen all the Ceanothus reproduction, like in Cuyamaca and all that area mm -hmm. that burned during the, uh, what, what fire was that? Cedar. Cedar fire. That seed bank was already there before the fire even happened. It could have been there over a century. But now it's becoming a continuous monoculture, and that's probably what it's going to be for a while. So, like the state park has been trying to deal with it, mastication doesn't work on it because it's so fibrous that it just bounds up the machine. Well, this actually works right here. But the question is, okay, so now you've chipped it all that, that down to the soil surface, it's going to come back. You know, and that's where I think if the objective is, if you really want to get rid of it, brush right on, you know, on a dozer or a bobcat, get those wood balls out of there. And hopefully the seed bank won't come back. But how are we going to get an EPA clearance for anything like that? Um, so you have hydraulic run-ups. So a lot of fuels machinery is being uh, purpose-built uh, to handle extra hydraulic needs. So basically you have a dedicated masticator you know, it comes, that's what it was engineered to do, that's all it does. Or you have modifications to existing machines. Uh, excavators usually have a lot of modifications. But what happens is that hydraulic power of the machines affects things like overall cutting efficiency and uh, part size. Uh, I've run an excavator where the hydraulics run to high flow, but what happened was that it took hydraulic power away from one track. So it would turn really good one way, but it had no pushing power to turn the other way. So, um, and then of course, if you want to watch some of this stuff, you could just look it up on YouTube. So we get to uh, machine taxonomy, or taxonomy. So the it, it's, it's an attachment or it's integral. So it's either attached to an existing machine or it's an integral part of the machine. An integral machine would be like a dedicated chipper. It has a drive, a drive shaft arrangement or it's passive. A passive means that uh, there really is no moving parts. The movement of the machine does the work. Anybody that's worked a, uh, say, a tractor with a GAN box on it to do a road, that's a passive type attachment. Uh, fuel modification pattern, uh, basically depends on your tool type. And then the brand, uh, brand model. So the fuel modification pattern, there's a difference between mastication with a true masticator head and a rotary disc. You'll see a rotary disc up here. I've seen them in action, I've used them. So for example, this is what's called, I mean this is a true mastication head right there. But it's also an attachment if you can see. There's holes right up here to be attached to an excavator. Those teeth there, I think they look like the carbide type um, cutting teeth. So those last a long time. Notice the chains on the bottom. Have any of you actually worked around large masticators? You don't want to be standing anywhere in the, that zone where you're throwing debris down. It will kill a person. So it's an attachment. This is horizontal. Uh, basically, when I say horizontal, that it's designed to be used like that in a horizontal pattern in accordance to the ground. 
It also is a shredder. And it's a uh, drum with hammer teeth. So I, don't, I can't see the hammer teeth on there. Those actually look like the, the carbide cutters to me. And of course, Fecon makes it. So Fecon has really done a great job in providing that niche forest, forestry mechanized market. I think they're probably some of the most top of the equipment out there. So the attachments are most common because if you think of it from a contracting standpoint, private contractor, are they going to buy, want to buy one excavator that costs two hundred fifty thousand dollars and just buy the attachments and have a real versatile machine for general forestry stuff, or are they going to want to buy a two hundred fifty thousand dollar dedicated masticator where that's all they can do is mastication. So they can only go after those mastication contracts specific to that machine. So these are locked by contractors because of versatility. It also allows multi-use of the platform for a contractor. Um, for example, you have an <clears throat> excavator. You can put, have with you a grapple attachment. So if you want to grab whole trees, and feed them into a you know, self-loading chipper or to a chipper. You can have a bucket attachment if you need to dig. You have a six-way blade on it. Say, for example, if the Forest Service asks you, well, hey, we need this road repair. Okay, got a six-way blade and a bucket. Perfect. Um, many others. You have uh, bunchers or, or tree hauling equipment on there. So they're probably your most versatile machine. So attachments must be matched to the platform. So if you have an excavator that produces X amount of hydraulic capacity, but your attachment requires this, it's going to run really inefficiently. And say, for example, if you're masticating, that drum is just going to basically stop because you don't have power to keep it going. And then, of course, there's danger to the equipment operator or bystanders. That's pretty self-explanatory. These, these actions of these machines are very violent, very violent. I mean, you think about it, to shred up something like chemise or a shrub oak, man, that's pretty powerful. You know, our soft flesh doesn't like it if we get hit by it. So here's a masticator head that goes on to an uh, excavator. Notice that attachment on the back for the improved hydraulic capacity. So this excavator, and and I'm, after I get done, I'm gonna kind of explain this to you why this is important. <coughs> so this excavator has the factory motor in it. So this machine is engineered just to run this machine itself. Well, so it's not engineered to run that with the hydraulic power. So that's an additional motor on the back, strictly dedicated to run a hydraulic pump. So this doesn't slow down at all. Your restriction for the mulcher head, though, is pretty much any about 30, 40 feet tall is all you can treat with it. Because if you try to top out a tree that's this big around, 40 feet up, where's that top going to go? It might just land on your machine. So that's kind of limited to how, what, how high you want your treatment go. So you have uh, different types of attachments. You have your flail knives. These things actually kind of are, are, are passive. They actually move back and forth without any, um, they're not, they're attached to the machine, but they allow for movement in there. They just kind of hang. And so basically here's an example of a hammer flail. And these work really good on if you're doing a treatment on your smaller diameter fuels, your woody debris. They work really well. They don't work really well if you're trying to say you're trying to um, mulch a fuel model 12, where there's heavy dead and down material on the ground, like logging slash. It doesn't work, but it works great for like our smaller diameter, like what we have up here. A rotary mulcher. So this is the rotary I was telling you about. So rather than that masticating head turning this way, the rotary blade turns this way like a big lawnmower, heavy duty lawnmower. 
So there's an example of the use for it. Uh, it works really well in pinion juniper, and it works uh, obviously really well in uh, some of your smaller diameter um, the bowls. The blades are free swinging because if it's attached to the machine permanently, if it stops, catastrophic failure. It needs to have some movement, so it basically centrifugal force that keeps that thing going. And then here's some of your other things that you will probably rarely see here. For example, your uh, rotary deck mowers. These are what you see down in your flatlands that your ranchers use to basically mow along the side of the road, things of that nature. Yeah. This stuff works really good for flat ground with really no rocks, uh, back east, southern rough uh, type treatment. Yeah, and here's your harrows and rakes. Uh, you won't ever see these here. I've only seen these exclusively used in basin sage type environment, flat rangeland, where you're trying, the objective is rangeland improvement for grazing allotment or something like that. You don't want to burn off the basin sage, but what you want to do is get rid of the old stuff for the new to come up for grazing. But you also, it's like, okay, but we also need habitat for the sage grouse and fire. I know all of us have fight fire in the Great Basin. When that sage burns, it, it burns and there's nothing left. It takes a while for it to come back. So this might be a better option. And then of course the root rake right there, or brush rake. I've used these before on a bobcat and a dozer. And they're very effective for taking out the brains of the plant that keeps just wanting to come back at shrub oak species. And I see these used more on the private lands under NRCS grants. We don't use them in the Forest Service or the BLM because anybody that has apologists or optimists at the end of their name, they literally just are terrified of the effects of the soil. And I would be too. And then you have integrated machines. It's usually purpose built, or usually a purpose built machine like a dedicated masticator. Uh, some serving a function uh, that we're not designed for, directly fuels reduction. That's what you see when you have like construction companies that are out of work trying to get forestry contracts and they think, oh, I have machines and I'll buy this attachment. Um, and also some can offer unique solutions to fuels treatment obstacles. Um, can anybody think of a fuels treatment obstacle in here? Just by sheer means of you being out in the forest trying to work or put in line. Rocks. Yeah, rock piles, man. You're not gonna get a dozer in rock piles, are you? Or a machine in rock piles. But you can sure skyline some of that stuff out, huh? Some of those areas if the objective is tree removal. So then you have your harvesters. Um, anybody that spent any time up north where there is a logging market, where it's politically acceptable, um, you will see these. This reduces time, it reduces effort, it's very efficient. You net really don't have people on the ground with chainsaws dumping trees waiting for the pillow punchers to get there. Um, this one here, if you've never seen it, it's all in one machine. It's specific purpose built. Down here is a cutter. Machine goes up, grabs a log, cuts it to length, you program what lengths you want, runs the whole log up and down it, it limbs the machine, and then, it, then when you get to the log length that you want, 10-6, 12-6, 16-6, that this saw right here just goes zip, cuts it. And then you can put that log anywhere to your deck or where your puncher can take it to the deck. And then you have uh, chippers, and I have a lot of experience with uh, the, this chip, these type chippers right here. I think this is. I think every agency should that has a chipper needs to get away from the tow behind chippers like this on our vehicles because it costs less money. You get that because you take the chipper to the pot.